Hi everyone, I just wanted to put together a quick little video to walk you through what you need to know for lesson one uh, to make sure that you are getting the highlights out of the reading. For a lot of us, this is going to be review material and it may be a kind of a kind of dry reading, uh, but there's some key jargon points that is important to start picking up. And what I mean by jargon, if you're not familiar with that term, is specific ways of saying things with definitions that are specific to a group of experts or knowledge base. We're used to having very informal definitions of what we mean by things. We talk about the internet, the web. And so what we're trying to do with these first few chapters is make sure that we all have the same base knowledge and agree what certain things mean. Uh, I'm gonna put a PowerPoint out when I'm done with this video and stick it out there for you. But I'm only gonna go through part of the PowerPoint today. It's largely provided by our Cengage textbook. Um, and I've customized it a little bit to make sure that we get to the right things. Um, but first, I want to remind you that we can see everything that's coming up, not just by looking at our lessons and going through our due dates on this chart, but if we click on my grades, everything should have a due date and it should all be set up. So I want to remind you that even though almost all of you have done it, the due date for the introductions wasn't really till next week to give us a chance to make sure everybody could get into the textbook, everybody could get their online services set up, that sort of thing. Uh, so if you're still a little slow on being able to get the textbook, don't worry about it. You don't have to do all the reading until next week. And then we're going to pick up from there with something due the week after that. Um, I also want to remind you, if you see, there's a view rubric for most of these assignments. If there's not a rubric, then it's something we're just checking to make sure that you actually delivered what you were supposed to deliver. And it'll be very like pass fail. Uh, with the rubrics, it describes exactly what I'm looking for. And I don't think you can see that. Uh, exactly what I'm looking for when I show you, you know, when you look at that and, and go through it. Okay. As for our PowerPoint, so this is our PowerPoint. We're talking about lesson one, the environment and the tools. Like, what do we mean by the internet? What's the difference between the internet and the web? Our objectives for this chapter is to be able to describe what is the internet, what is the web, and to be able to use kind of technical terms to say, okay, this is the difference between them talk about ways to access the internet and the web, and I snuck in some basic computer knowledge that you must, must, must know in, on these slides. Talks, type, vida, types of website, which is here or there. We're, we're really familiar with this. This is just putting some fancy, fancy languages on things you already know. Identify some web design tools. We'll talk about what we're gonna be doing and explain web design principles, roles, and required skills. The key concepts that you need to know, and this is whether you're IT support, a programmer, a cybersecurity, data analyst, we need to know what bits, bytes, BPS, MBPS means. We'll get to that in a second. Hopefully you already know what those are, uh, but if you don't, we will cover them thoroughly. We are gonna talk about the difference between local versus remote. One of the things you're supposed to get out of this course is this idea for the rest of your courses that you know where your files are. You understand how to read a file system, you under, understand how to read references to a file system, and you are able to kind of function in that computer environment where you can picture in your head what is physically going on when you go out and get a file on the internet. So we're gonna talk about local versus remote, client versus server, and parts of the URL. So what is a network? It's important to remember that just like you have a laptop, you have a physical device on your uh, lap, on, on your desk, uh, in your hand when you're accessing the internet, there's an actual network of connected computers that are all physically connected, except for when it's you know, radio waves or Wi-Fi, that are talking to each other. You are talking to an actual machine out there somewhere. And most of what we're gonna learn in this course is how we're gonna arrange data and place it on that machine, make sure that it's accessible to everybody else, yada, yada, yada. So the internet 
is that network of all connected machines. The internet has many protocols, which is many different ways of computers talking to each other that serve different purposes. They can be custom designed, that is a whole other class, but the internet is the network itself. What we think of as the World Wide Web or WWW is just part of the internet that focuses on exchanging files in a very specific way. We call these files web pages and they are formatted documents that allow us to mark up what they're supposed to look like and have that be interpreted so that we can all share and exchange information. It all grew out of this need for scientists and the military to be able to share information. Kind of the, one of the original driving forces in the United States at least uh, was that the military wanted to create this network in case we get nuked. And so in case we get nuked, we built this interconnected system of passing messages. Of course, to build it, we needed a bunch of scientists working together to exchange information, to figure out how to connect things together. And the more they used it while they were building it to exchange information about how they were building it, the more obvious it became that this is what academics want too, that we need to be able to share information. And so we first, you know, the first use of the internet was sending papers and stuff back and forth. There are old protocols that you may or may not have heard of like Archie, uh, long before FTP, where you could go out and search in the internet and find academic documents primarily and it quickly evolved from there. So a web page is one document that's been formatted so your computer can read it, but a website is a group of web pages. Kind of picky terms to, to start differentiating in your mind. So we talk about bits per second. The speed that data can travel from one uh, device to another is the transfer rate and we have how many bits can you send in one second? So we talk about how many bits you can send in one second. We have to know what is a bit. And it goes back into the binary representation that we're all hopefully at least loosely familiar with that uh, computers transfer data as ones and zeros. It can either be on or it can be off. It is a single binary digit, one bit. It's supposed to be in abbreviations that if there's a small b in the abbreviation it means bits as in megabits per second not megabytes per second if it has a capital b it means megabytes per second so bytes is eight bits eight bits uh one byte used to be the smallest accessible unit on on your computer uh you could handle bits basically eight at a time and you can move them around quickly. Now, as we know, we're up to 64 bit processors and we move around 64 bits at a time. All of that gets handled more in your operating. That's a, that's an, a NAS class question, not, not a CTI question, but we're going to introduce this bit bits and bytes. Think about transferring data back and forth. Once we transfer that data, the web browser is that software package that is visible to the end user. That's where HTML, CSS, JavaScript is interpreted. It, what's really important to remember is that because that content is all visible to the user, that security and privacy are entirely up to that web browser. Some of them can be good about it. Some of them can be bad about it. And so just as an example, on any web page, if you want to know how it works and how it looks together, you can right click on it and click view source. And that's going to show you all the content of the web page. This is all of our markup languages that we're going to talk about in a second, our text, our links, all of our content is visible. It can't be hidden because it's Chrome that has to read that and interpret it. So think about the, while you're reading through the, the book, think about the privacy implications of that. You can't put anything into your HTML or CSS or JavaScript that you don't want to be read by the user. And because of that, if you go to like 
Google.com, they tend to have deliberately hard to read JavaScript spitting out their code because they're trying to more or less discourage people from being able to copy what they do and do it exactly the way that they do it. There may be some other reasons why they do it this way, but I think that's one of the big ones. It's called, uh, it's just a way of making sure that people can't look at your code. So we'll talk more about how that works and all that. But what I wanted to remind you guys is that when we're going through our assignments, being able to right click and look at your code is a handy thing. Being able to right click and look at how some other website did it is a great way to learn. However, of course, keep in mind academic integrity, we can't copy how they did it. We can just be inspired by how they did it and say, oh, that's a strategy that works for that. All right. So when we talk about content that's in the browser, we think of that as being local or client side or front end work. When we talk about content that's on the server, we say that's the server side or that's the remote side or that's the back end. In this class, this semester, we're gonna be mostly focused on the front end. Databases are a little bit on the back end. When we get to a website in the browser, one of the key language concepts that you need to know is that web address that you think of as being a web address is called a URL. It's formatted in a very specific way on purpose. A lot of us have gotten into the habit of kind of halfway typing in URLs and just letting our browser complete. A lot of us still Google everything instead of typing in the address uh, bar. But the thing in the address bar is the URL, and it's formatted in a very specific way. It's the protocol, the domain name, and the top level designation. So for the most of us, it's going to be either be HTTP, which is Hyper Text Transfer Protocol, or it's going to be HTTPS, and that S is for secure. The domain name can be an IP address or a text version of that address. We'll talk about what we mean by that in just a second. So first bit, the protocol, HTTP. How am I going to reach out? I'm going to reach out to a server that's going to give me hypertext. www.boston.com is called the domain name. The .com is the top level name. Then there's a slash and then there are folders. This slash right here between the com and the news means the default directory for this server. So when I say it means the default directory for this server, it means we have designated a file system folder somewhere out on our hard drive. And we say, this is where we're gonna put all our web stuff. And so the web server starts from there. If there's a folder in that folder called news, then you can get to it by putting slash, which is the root or base folder and news, the folder name inside of it. And then you can keep navigating from there. If you need more help, some more concepts with navigating, there's definitely stuff in chapter zero that talks about navigating your file system uh, and server um, addresses and protocols. Little tip. If you're building your web page and you've got something that says file colon slash slash, remember you're looking at that in your actual file system. You are not asking a server for that. So that means it is visible to you and only you and only on the exact computer that you're working on. So let's talk about those pieces of the URL. The protocol, like I said before, is how you will access the data. It can be file, HTTP, FTP for file transfer protocol, which is a special way, you know, a server, basically a way of browsing the files on the server is FTP. It can even be mailed to, even though that is not used nearly as often. We used to, it used to be the default where if you wanted to have somebody send you an email, you just popped up mail to, um, but then 
security being what it is, people started copying all these and making lists of address and then getting tons and tons of spam mail. So we don't really use mail to anymore. With web email, a lot of us don't even have an email program on our computer set up. We go to a website that does our email for us. So mail to wouldn't even work for us. Then it's important to remember what comes after the protocol is the server name. It's a specific server or virtual server which will handle the request. So it is an actual machine with that name. So if we've got www.boston.com, the www, like if you have www.google, is a computer named www. There's an actual machine or part of a machine out there that has been given that name. Later, we're gonna be talking to hermes.waketech.edu. Hermes is a specific computer that is out there that is set up to be a server. Then comes the domain name, which is basically the company or the, the location of the server, the memorable thing that you have. And then the top level domain is the .com, .edu, .org, .tv, whatever it is, which is this way of categorizing domains so we can look up their information. Now that is the word version that is easy for humans to read. In order for computers to do anything with it, they have to convert it to this unique identifier called an IP address. When we look up the IP address from the domain name, that's called a DNS lookup. DNS is dynamic naming service. The, the ability to give a, a name that humans can read to this IP address, internet protocol address, so that everybody agrees there's one and only one www.google.com. What we pass around is HTML, hypertext markup language, which is a text that has tags put into it those tags tell you what kind of information that you should be putting into a given section, how the browser should treat that information. And it's basically a way of drawing a bunch of boxes and saying this box should be looking like this. This box should be looking like that. Uh, when we have a tag and it'll show you the tag and we'll get into more details of this, it's important to remember that you have open and closed tags. Syntax is important you need to write things the exact way it's meant to be written with opening brackets, closing brackets, quotation marks. And so when we get to the typing portions of it, this will be done for us. Oh, sorry. When we get to the typing portions of it, we'll do that ourselves. This will be done for us when we are using Dreamweaver. So you can kind of get used to seeing how it's supposed to look um, and copying things exactly, and then get some practice with typing up syntax that has to be formatted in a specific way. There's a thing called the W3 Consortium, W3C, that sets our standards for what browsers are supposed to do when they encounter certain tags. We are now at HTML5. A lot of the examples we're gonna be used are, are not really using the features of HTML5. HTML5 made it a lot easier to describe natural language uh, tags so that instead of having to have just a bunch of random boxes, you can say this box is a footer, this box is a header, and use actual English words to describe pieces of your web page so that when you read your web page's code, it makes sense what things are. We will come back to that in many future classes. Um, this is like basically the same information. XML is like HTML, but with less focus on the internet. It's basically just a way of marking up uh, text content. So you can say this text has a certain meaning. It's all about markup languages are all about marking up text to give meaning to pieces of it. And this is basically showing how it looks. And then we use, once we have the text marked up and we say, all right, these are what the pieces are, we will get into CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. Cascading Style Sheets is just a list of rules 
that says, all right, if you're going to do this, it should look like this. This is what color it should be. This is what font it should be. This is how it should be positioned. And you can cascade or fall down from the top through the rules and say, okay, do this, this, and this. Now do this, this, and this. And whatever rule or whatever the calculated rule is, whatever the end result, the last thing you did, um, that's what it ends up looking like. So you can apply one rule and then say, but in this condition, change this to this. And in this condition, change this to this. And so you can design websites that function under a variety of purposes by setting up these rules to make things pretty. So we're gonna be learning HTML to, to learn about hypertext markup language and cascading style sheets to make our HTML pretty. We will not be doing scripting languages in this class anymore. In this class, we used to do scripting languages. We used to do a little bit of PHP, which is basically a structural language that the server evaluates or, well, that's for PHP is a structural language. The server evaluates so that it can change some of the text based on certain conditions, talking to a database or something like that. JavaScript is run on the browser and it can do the same thing. It is interactive. It gives you interactive interactivity in your website by running this program in the background. These are all future course things. We're just bringing them up to mention these are things you can do. Create active content. The bad side is some kinds of active content are what we call malware. So if you're not careful, you can introduce flaws into your code that enable people to do damaging things to your server. That's why they get whole courses devoted towards them. Just a book goes through a brief reminder that a text editor is software used to create text files. You can type up all the markup. As you can see, make sure you have your your brackets correctly, your open and close quotation marks correctly, and, and learn about text editors. Whereas an HTML editor is like a text editor, but it knows the rules of HTML and it can do things like change the color of things. So Notepad++ is a text editor, which means it doesn't really give you any assistance or help, but it also doesn't get in your way. Visual Studio Code is a HTML editor. It knows what HTML is supposed to look like so it can color code it, uh, what they call syntax highlighting, and tell you how a browser is going to interpret it or fail to interpret it as you go. And we'll be talking about how to use these many times in future classes. It's just an example of the difference. So text editor, black and white, uh, a web development tool like Dreamweaver gives you colors and syntax highlightings. And then Dreamweaver itself is a WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. We're going to do some researching on that for next class, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, although maybe, maybe it'll help me figure out who actually watches the videos. And that's it. That is the main points that you need to get out of this text. If you flip through the rest of the slideshow, you realize that, you know, there's some interesting things in there that it mentions, helps you differentiate things. But the primary focus we're trying to get are some of these key terms about how things are working, where data is on the internet, what it means to be on the internet versus on the web, and that sort of thing. So, so if you have any questions about those concepts, please do reach out to me. Um, other than that, you only have this reading and you have the forum boards due for lesson one, which most of you have already completed. So have a great week and let me know if you are having any problems.